mission of Job Club is to provide a positive environment for job seekers to network and learn best practices for the job search. We meet the second and the fourth Tuesday of each month. You can find the schedule of topics at ukalumni.net forward slash job club. We always welcome your ideas for future topics and speakers. Feel free to put those in the chat box or email us. We will begin working on our schedule for next year shortly. So we do welcome your ideas. I'm Caroline Francis, Director of UK Alumni Career Services. Other members of our Job Club facilitation team are Diana Doggett, Extension Specialist, Special Projects, Amanda Shagney, Associate Director, UK Alumni Career Services. We also have Nicole Waite, Employment Specialist with UK Steps Temporary Employment. Lots of behind the scenes folks that help bring you Job Club that we, we have to thank for all that they do. Suzanne Smith and um, Sunny Sailor with Extension. We have Queen Sullivan, Christy Kaufman, and Lindsay Caudle with UK Alumni Association. Thanks to our awesome team. Job Club is currently hosted in a hybrid format in person at the Fayette County Cooperative Extension Office via Zoom webinar, where there's a chat, mo um, chat box moderator available, and Facebook Live, but that's a view only option, no chat moderator or job lead newsletter. Please review our free Job Club resource packet. Lots of great tips. That'll be a uh, link to that in the newsletter, also on our website fabulous articles that we put together to help you with your job search. Employers and recruiters are always welcome at Job Club, either in person um, or if you are on Zoom, we will share the mic with you at the end. You will have a one minute spotlight to share active job leads and that'll be later in our program today. Also, watch your email. Later today, we will send a newsletter with job leads that have been sent our way. Please note that some people attending Job Club, either on Zoom or in person, are conducting a confidential job search. So we ask that you respect the confidentiality of people you may notice uh, in the chat box or in person at Job Club. Check out job-related articles included in our Job Club email reminders. Um, we share a couple of articles at the bottom of those, very timely articles. Also, recordings and PowerPoint slides are available at ukalumni.net forward slash job club. Welcome to our first timers. I know we have a few in our audience today. We welcome you. Um, also, we probably have several online first time viewers, so welcome to Job Club. You will receive a follow-up survey later today, and this feedback will place you in our notification system. Um, so look for that later today so that you will know about upcoming programs. Success stories. I know Amanda and I are both working with individual career clients that have, are getting some interviews and job offers that should be extended, we are hoping, this week. Um, good luck to all of them. Um, Kay, also here in our audience, has shared the good news that the resume review that she took advantage of after last job club, she updated her resume after many years. It looks great. And it's already landed her an interview for this Friday. So good luck in that interview on Friday. Glad you're here today to learn tips for interviewing. Please share in the chat box any other success stories you may have. Perhaps you've scheduled a networking coffee. Maybe you have an interview. And definitely when you land the job, let us know so that we can celebrate with you. It's the highlight of our week getting emails from job club attendees and clients who have gotten a new job. So you're all getting closer. Just do a little something each day on your job search. Any success stories coming in there? All right. We, we always love to hear. So please share with us those success stories. At this time, I would like to introduce our speaker today. 
Sarah Madison. She has been a former colleague and friend, and we're delighted to have her as a first time Job Club presenter. Sarah is a talent development consultant for Coastal Cloud based in Lexington, Kentucky. She has over 15 years of recruiting, coaching, and teaching experience in higher education. Before joining Coastal Cloud, she was at the University of Kentucky's Gatton College of Business and Economics as the director of the Graham Office of Career Management. Prior to that, she held career and admissions roles at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, Wake Forest University, and the Ohio State University. She is a Gallup Certified Strength Coach and a Certified MBTI Practitioner. Her passions include helping others find a successful path and keeping focused on problem solving and positive outcomes. Thank you, Sarah, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Um, I know I've followed Job Club for years and I always see the great lineup of speakers and resources that Caroline and Amanda offer. So I was thrilled um, to get the opportunity to be here with you. Um, so I'm going to dive in a little bit here. Let's see. Oops, I went too fast. Okay, so I, I did want to do, do a little bit of an overview about um, just what Coastal Cloud is, what I do as a talent development consultant. Um, thank you, Caroline, for sharing that background a little bit. So you have a little bit of a lay of the land. Um, so I'm going to cover that. We're going to talk about interview prep. And then we're going to jump into some common interview questions and strategies. And so when I put those questions up on the screen, your heart might race a little bit if you're thinking about yourself in an interview situation. So we'll just I'll take a deep breath and um, process how we might want to answer those questions. And then we'll have time for um, some questions that you might have for me at the end. I'm happy to answer anything. Um, so like Caroline said, um, I'm with Coastal Cloud. Um, and some of you might be familiar with Coastal Cloud, some of you might not, um, but we are a technology consulting firm and we're headquartered in Palm Coast, Florida. This is just a little bit about where our people are. We're a pretty remote workforce. So 90% of our people work remotely. Um, and then we do have a few solution centers and you can see we do have a Lexington, Kentucky solution center, which is where I'm sitting today and joining you from. And we're right um, in the Chevy Chase area of Lexington, directly above a Starbucks, which is good and bad for my budget and my caffeine. Um, but that's where we are here in Lexington. And then we have our Palm Coast, Florida headquarters, Tallahassee, Florida. Um, we have a solution center. We have a Denver, Colorado office. We do have a small office in Louisville, and then we have kind of clusters of people in the Atlanta area, the DC area. But then, like I said, about 90% of our people work remotely. Um, Coastal Health has been around for 10 years. Uh, so we just celebrated our 10 year um, anniversary. And when the co-founders um, of our company, they're actually a married couple. And when they started Coastal Cloud, there were a few things they really wanted to commit to um, because they had had experience at previous consulting firms. So one of those things was this truly remote nature of the work that we do. They realized with video technology and all the technology that's available, we can do these jobs from anywhere. So um, you can see down in the fun section, we do have a live at the beach, work in the cloud motto here in Lexington. We like to say live in horse country or bourbon country um, and work in the cloud. Um, so, so that is a big tenant of ours, that, that flexibility. Um, and we've been doing that for 10 years. So it was interesting, you know, when COVID came around, um, most of our people were already remote. So it, it really didn't impact um, too much um, how we do the work that we do for our clients. So that's just a little bit about where we are. Um, as far as what we do, we are, um, we harness the power of the cloud. Uh, so that's, that's a Quick way to put it, um, one way that I'd like to explain what we do is that we are business consultants. We help our clients, and you'll see a little bit more about who our clients are, but we help our clients solve their problems. We just happen to solve those problems using technology. So that's where the technology piece comes in. Um, and so we, our, our goal is to make our clients be the best version of themselves. So some, I think that's interesting. One way to think about it, you might not have heard of Coastal Cloud, you might not have even heard of Salesforce, which you'll see that logo there on this screen, but we are a Salesforce partner 
we work within Salesforce in that ecosystem to help our clients. And really the goal, right, if we're trying to make our clients better um, and get their name out there and get them more business or more donations or more enrollment, right, then that then our goal is accomplished. So it's not so much about we don't need people to necessarily know who Coastal Cloud is. We need them to know who our clients are. All right, so I mentioned Salesforce. Um, some of you may be familiar with Salesforce, some of you may not. Um, if you are not familiar with Salesforce, it is a customer relationship management tool. Um, and I, you know, working within the Salesforce platform, um, I, in my um, experience at Coastal Cloud so far, I've learned so much about what this platform is capable of doing. If you're not familiar with it, you probably have interacted with it and you didn't even know it. Um, so when you, you know, are on a website for a company and there, there's a pop-up that says, hey, get 10% off your first order. If you put your email address in here, you're probably entering your email address into either Salesforce or some other CRM tool. And then that manages that customer or client relationship that you now have with that organization. Um, and, and this is across all different industries. On the left-hand side, you can kind of see um, some of the products that Salesforce either owns or integrates with. Um, Trailhead is a free training platform where you can teach yourself Salesforce. Um, a lot of companies use this tool and you in the future, in a future role, might be a user of Salesforce. And so Trailhead, they've realized that they need to offer this free um, learning management system so that people can figure out how to navigate um, Salesforce and whatever job that they have. Some of you might be familiar with Tableau if you have ever done any kind of data visualization um, or you know data, even just data migration or management and then telling a story with data, Tableau is owned by Salesforce. And so it integrates very well. Um, so this is just a little more about the different products. And then I think this is a helpful visual. So Salesforce um, can integrate and work with everything you see on the screen. Um, and it's mobile friendly. So they have that little um, smartphone on there but you can really run any aspect of any business using this platform. And as you glance through there, you'll see a lot of things that you recognize and they all have integrations with the platform. Um, so it kind of becomes this all-in-one um, system that you can use. Oh, thank you, Amanda, for putting that Trailhead link. Um, what's interesting about Trailhead, I, I encourage you all to go check it out. Do a couple badges. It's kind of fun. It's gamified. You get points. Um, there's little woodland creatures that scurry around, um, but there are badges on learning the technology. There are also badges on mindfulness, or there's probably some interviewing strategy badges on there, and it's totally free. Um, so it's a great, great resource. And then I did mention that we have clients in every industry. These are some of the nine core industries that we work in. We've completed over 5,000 projects in these different industries. We have teams that are you know, focused in on these industries. And so as you look through this, you probably are realizing, oh, wow, yes, I interact with a lot of these industries, especially um, healthcare. Um, everyone interacts with healthcare, right? So, um, so we work across all of these industries. Here are a few logos of some of our clients. And again, it, you can see that we work across uh, the nonprofit industry, higher education, uh, manufacturing. Here in Lexington, I would say we have a focus on our manufacturing clients because there is a lot of manufacturing around here. Um, and so that's a little bit of the focus that we have here. All right, so that's background on Coastal Cloud. So you kind of know who I am, where I'm coming from, um, and in my role in talent development, I get the privilege of working with our employees to help them figure out what their career path looks like here at Coastal Cloud in the Salesforce ecosystem, um, just helping them determine what, what they want to do, where they want to go, and then setting their goals to make sure they're getting there. Um, and then also part of that um, role is helping our different business units with their hiring practices, whether it's, um, you know, interns. Um, or helping interns become full-time um, analysts, with, which is usually the entry-level position and analyst position within our company, and then get on the road to be a, being a consultant. Um, and then it goes on from there. Um, I could do a whole session on the Salesforce 
career paths and ecosystem, um, but we'll keep this specific to um, interviews in general. But I do get to sit in on a lot of interviews, conduct a lot of interviews, um, and I've worked with a lot of companies in my um, experience in higher education to learn more about how they do interviews and what they're looking for. So I want before I get into the questions that you might get in an interview, I did want to talk a little bit about setting the stage. And if you feel like some of the things I'm saying today are common sense, that's great. You're, you're on the right path. Some of this might feel like, oh, yes, duh, of course, um, common sense. But I put it all in here because I have you know, seen people make mistakes, even when it comes to the basics. So I just want to make sure you have all your bases covered. You've thought about everything. So when it comes to preparing for your interview, obviously, you want to do a lot of research. Um, you need to get to know the organization that you're interviewing for, and ideally you have some names of some of the people that you'll be meeting, and the more research and prep you can do ahead of time, the better, um, and it just makes you more prepared when you show up for that interview. It, you know, you come across as invested because you did take the time to do that research, so when it comes to researching the company, um, press releases are a great tool, so you can just look at the news um, and see what they are emphasizing when it comes to um, controlling the narrative about their own company, but then you can also research just what other news articles there are out there. You can usually find a lot of information on the company website, um, dig deep into that website. Don't just do the one careers page, you know, make sure you're understanding as much as you can about how the business is structured or um, what their <coughs> mission and values are, things like that. Um, and then another piece in your company research you want to try to determine is a little bit more about the culture. So are they a more traditional company? You might think of a conservative traditional industry like the banking industry um, or, you know, um, financial markets, or um, maybe they're just a large entity um, that is known for being more conservative. Um, those are the kind of things that you want to try to figure out in your research. Um, you can find uh, LinkedIn, powerful tool. If you're not, please be on LinkedIn, use LinkedIn um, in this research process. Um, and then also you can um, try to determine if they're not, you know, a more conservative company, what is the company culture? Um, I will just plant the seed that uh, some of you may have heard of Glassdoor. Glassdoor is also a tool you can use to research companies. Um, and I, I wouldn't shy away from it, but I will say usually on Glassdoor, you're going to get either the employees that are really happy and love where they work and the employees that are, are really grumpy <laughs> or disgruntled or, you know, something happened. Um, and so you get these polarizing, usually these polarizing opinions. So I do think it can be a helpful tool. Um, just make sure that you're reading all of that with a grain of salt um, and, and making sure that you were being objective and kind of assessing that company um, on your own. But if you see something in your research on Glassdoor that you want to bring as a question um, in your interview, at the end of the interview, then do that. Just do it in a professional way. Uh, people research. LinkedIn, best tool. Um, hopefully you can get a little sense of who you're meeting with. What is their background? How long have they been there? Um, have they been you know, promoted up through the organization? Um, in my opinion, that's a good sign, right? There's that, that room for growth within a company. Um, so make sure you're researching your people. Okay, the medium. Um, is it a virtual interview or an in-person interview? Obviously, a lot more, more and more interviews are being conducted virtually these days. You do wanna clarify what kind of platform are you gonna be interviewing on? Is it Zoom? Is it Google Meet, uh, WebEx? Microsoft Teams, right? There's all these different platforms. Um, so make sure you know what technology you're using and hopefully, ideally, you can test that out before you have your interview, test your speaker, test your microphone. Um, make sure that you have good Wi-Fi, nice strong Wi-Fi, you know, um, to conduct your interview. If you are having issues with the technology, you wanna figure that out, you know, ahead of time. You don't want that to happen at the beginning of the interview. Um, so make sure you spend some time doing that. Um, other things virtually, you do want to think about your background. Um, so what's behind you? And again, I say these things and you might be like, well, yes, Sarah, duh, that's common sense. Of course, you want to have a professional background. But I have been on interviews 
uh, that were not, um, it was not professional um, in the background. Either it was just distracting, there's a lot going on, or it was messy, um, right? Like I don't need, I don't necessarily want, uh, the, the thing about the virtual world we live in is we're like coming into each other's homes sometimes, <laughs> like you're invading people's personal space. Uh, but sometimes that's the best place they have to do the interview. And so if it is a, your bedroom, right, maybe turn the camera so I'm not seeing your bed, especially if it's not made, um, or um, just consider a blur. Um, you can blur the background on certain platforms. Again, this goes back to what platform you're using. Make sure you know what the capabilities are. Um, okay, so I think that's everything for virtual. For your in-person interviews, you do want to make sure you know where you're going. Um, if you have the time to drive, follow the directions, do it a couple of days ahead of time. Uh, make sure you know where you're going to park, where you're going to go within the building. Um, very, very clear um, directions. Most companies will provide that for you, but do make sure you read through that um, and you know where you're going and what you're doing. Um, and then also in person, that's a little different than virtual, I would say. Virtual interview, if you're scheduled for a 9 a.m. interview virtually, um, you probably want to be like ready to log on at least five minutes before the interview starts, but you might find that your interviewer is not going to show up till right at nine o'clock. I know in, in my work, I'm usually scheduled pretty back to back. So if I have an interview starting at nine, I will be getting to that interview at nine, because at 8.59, I was probably wrapping up um, the previous meeting or the previous interview. So virtually, you know, being a few minutes logged on is fine, um, but it's probably gonna start pretty much right on time. For your in-person, you wanna arrive early, um, but not too early. So you wanna get there. I suggest getting there no more than 15 minutes before your interview starts. You can get to the parking lot. You can make sure you know where you're going. You can be parked, prepping in your car, reviewing your notes, checking your, you know, checking your hair, whatever you need to do. But um, you don't necessarily need to walk into that building too early um, because sometimes uh, I feel like the interviewers just don't, if they don't have a great place for you to wait or they don't really know what to do with you and maybe it's a group interview and not everybody's ready yet, um, so just don't come too early. I would say like 15 minutes before the interview um, and then up until, I mean, five minutes before the interview is probably cutting close. So I would say that 10 to 15 minute window before it starts um, is a good time to arrive. Um, all right, dress, what to wear. If you have a comfortable relationship and you've gotten to know the recruiter that you've been working with or the hiring manager you've been working with, it is totally appropriate to ask um, if you're not sure. Um, it, sometimes that can help you get insight onto what the day-to-day -day dress in an office is like. For example, at Coastal Cloud, we are very casual. I mean, in the summertime, people are wearing flip-flops and shorts. You know, With a very remote workforce, we dress pretty casually. Um, so when I think about someone coming in for an interview, and if they ask me for advice on what I would wear, I would usually say you want to go one step above whatever their day to day is. So if I'm talking with a candidate who has an interview with us and they asked me what they should wear, they don't need to wear, you know, for men, they don't need to wear a full on suit um, or for women, like a pantsuit or skirt suit, full business um, formal, just because that's not our culture. So I would say a step down from that. Um, so I would say business casual if someone were to ask me, because when they come into the office, especially if it's an in-person interview, they will notice that, you know, a lot of our people are just very casually. Um, so then they're just, you know, one step up from that. Now, if someone were to come and we get this, some people come dressed full business formal, that's not a knock against them. That's totally fine. I'd rather be overdressed than underdressed. Um, so just try to get a sense of maybe what the day-to-day -day is, and that can help you decide what to wear. Um, then there's always the debate of virtual dress. Do you wear the full suit? Do you not? Um, and my recommendation is always to be dressed head to toe. I do think it helps your confidence level. Um, some people, when they just get that interview outfit on, it just boosts their confidence. Um, and then also you just never know what if something happens and you do have to hop up and, you know, take care of something. Um, you want to be fully dressed. Um, now, I know people don't always do that. And if it's a virtual interview, they just are dressed from the waist up and, and that's fine too, but hopefully you don't have to worry about anything happening. 
I like to remove any possibility that something could. Um, so that's why I would recommend dressing head to toe and also it can boost your confidence. All right. I, I would also recommend in your dress to limit the distractions that might happen. Um, so I, I'm not telling you to stifle your style. We want to see your personality and we want to see if you, you know, if you have bright pink hair, that's awesome. Like that, it fits very much with our culture. So I don't want to uh, just stifle who you are, how you dress, you know, what that's, that's all part of your personality. But if you have the ability to limit the distractions that can help me focus on what you were talking about and the content that you're sharing. Um, so, you know, just try to consider that and maybe virtually you would wear a little more muted colors um, or in person you would edit uh, the accessories a little bit. Um, but, but again, like you want to be yourself because you want to fit in culturally, but just Try, try to keep in mind that um, things that can be a distraction just are going to take away from the content of what you're saying. Um, and first impressions are important, right? All right, that's dress. And then on what to bring, um, definitely some kind of pen and, and notepad, right? You, there's nothing I love more than I'm in an interview and, we get in and someone has questions and I notice that they're actually taking notes. It makes me feel like, oh, okay, what I'm saying is important enough to them that they're gonna jot it down. Um, that means they're taking it seriously. So you do wanna have something to write with because you don't know, you know, maybe they're gonna tell you, oh, by the way, the next date of round of interviews is X, Y, Z date. Like you wanna be able to, to jot that down uh, without um, bringing out your phone or a device. So I would have something to write with. Um, in some cases, it's appropriate to bring samples of your work um, so maybe you had uh, almost like a portfolio if you have done um, some graphic design or some marketing projects or um, maybe even some data visualizations for us. Like, I'd love to see that. So it, it might be appropriate to bring samples of your work. And then the questions that you're going to ask at the end, which I'm going to get a little more detail on that. You do want, I would have those written down or printed out or you know, whatever is, is helpful for you, just so in the moment, if you're nervous, you don't, you don't forget what you wanted to ask. So I would bring that. Um, and then uh, jury's out on whether you need to bring a, your phone into the interview. I know a lot of people recommend just leave it in your car that way you don't have to worry about, like, did I turn the ringer off? Am I gonna get distracted? Um, I think some people are more comfortable keeping it with them, but just making sure it's silenced and out of the way. Um, so if you're carrying some kind of bag, you can kind of keep it down in there and, and just not have it be a distraction. Um, but if you're nervous at all about getting a call or um, it going off uh, from, from an alarm you forgot you set, um, then just leave it, leave it out of sight. Um, and same thing virtually, try to limit the distractions um, when you're in a virtual interview so you can really focus all right, let's move on to some questions and formats of questions. So here are six different kinds of questions that you might encounter in an interview. There are, so I'm going to talk through each of these and, and hopefully give you some examples. Verification questions. So verification questions, at least in our line of business, we're trying to make sure um, that if you say you have some kind of certification or um, degree or certificate. We're trying to just verify um, the information that you're presenting. So we might ask a, a little bit more about your background um, or, you know, when you got cer certain certifications or, um, you know, have you had to regularly keep those up? What's that process like? Have you completed it? Um, verifying information. Competency questions. For us, competency questions usually come in the later stages of an interview, of the interview cycle, so maybe a second or a third interview even. Um, and that's where we really are trying to test your knowledge. Um, so we might say, you know, in our work, we might give you an example of working with a client and say, what would you do um, to see how you, uh, if you know what you're talking about when it comes to Salesforce, especially. So that would be more of a competency question. Competency questions on steroids. Let's jack it up a level. And that's when you get into case interviews. Um, and case interviews can either be something that you are given ahead of time 
or they could be on the spot case interviews. So a case interview is you are presented with a case, a business case, and are asked to prepare, take some time. You're, if you're given it ahead of time, you might have a, a week, a few days to prepare. And they may say, you know, here's the business case. We've got this client, this is their problem, or you know, this is what you need to solve for. Please prepare a slide deck of how you're going to approach this problem and what your recommendation to the client is going to be. And there'll be a lot more information in there about what kind of company they are, um, what you know, some of the numbers, um, how they're how they're um, projecting their revenue growth might be part of it. Um, how uh, we usually provide some information um, to help people navigate Salesforce that they haven't spent much time in it, but how to use Salesforce in the the answer that they're going to <laughs> present. Um, so that would be one that you prep for ahead of time, more of a case interview that's on the spot. And this is common too, especially in the consulting industry is you show up that day and you're given a case and maybe you're given a little bit of time to read through it. And then you almost are processing it out loud with your interviewer. And you maybe you're asking follow-up questions they want to see, well, what questions are they going to ask? How are they going to prepare for this? And when, then what their recommendation is going to be. In these scenarios, um, you usually are told that there's no wrong answer. They, they really just want to see how you problem solve. So what is your thought process? How do you come to the conclusions that you come to? What are the questions that you ask along the way? Sometimes in a case interview, they intentionally leave out information. Like they know that you need to know what the market share is, but they don't put that in the case because they want to see, are they going to ask what the market share is um, for this product, right? So, so sometimes um, they leave information out because they just want to see how you process. So if you are going in to a case interview, you should know in advance um, so you can kind of study and prepare um, and be ready. And there's a lot of great resources out there for case interviews um, on how to prepare for those. So that is a whole different beast. Um, case interviews, but but please, if you do have one, make sure you're very well prepared and you spend a lot of time um, prepping and, and just being ready for that. Behavioral based. These are probably the more common questions that you all have heard in previous interviews, but these are the tell me about a time when, or give me an example of a time when you X, Y, and Z. The, the goal of behavioral based interviews employers are tr trying to predict what you're going to do in the future when you're working as an employee. One way to do that is to look at your past behavior. Um, are they, do they show initiative? Um, do they have examples of times they've solved, you know, difficult challenges? They're trying to, you know, predict future behavior using past behavior. Um, so you will see a lot of behavioral based interviews um, and questions. And we're going to, in the next slide, talk through some of those as examples. Um, brain teaser questions. These can just be fun <laughs> um, questions that are thrown out to try to see how you do on, you know, when you're put in a situation and have to think quickly. Um, and an example of a brain teaser, actually, um, Amanda and I experienced this one years ago. I think you remember this one, Amanda, but we had some students who were asked kind of as a brain teaser, what are three uses for a paperclip besides clipping paper. So as a student, these were uh, graduate students, they were like, what? You just asked me what to do with a paper clip besides clipping paper? What does that have to do with this job that I'm interviewing for? And the answer is nothing. <laughs> um, yeah, so we got, it was great. They come up, came up with some really creative ideas um, from like unfolding it to use it to, you know, clean out something. Um, I can't remember what some of the other one was, uh, other ones were, but yeah, y'all think about that and see if you can come up with some creative uses for a paperclip. Um, another one I had that I heard about recently was, uh, and this kind of toes the line between a brain teaser and a fit culture question. Oh yeah. Make a chain to hang a picture. That's a good one. Um, so this one toes the line, but, uh, we had, uh, this was actually here at Coastal Cloud. One of our hiring managers asked a candidate, all right, Sarah, here's the situation. It's the apocalypse, okay? The, everything's shut down. There's no power. There's no water. There's no government or structure. 
no cell phones. Like we are in the apocalypse. You and your closest friends have commandeered a grocery store. What are you going to do? How are you going to stay alive? Um, and then caveat, this is not a zombie apocalypse. So no zombies, just normal apocalypse. <laughs> and so, and she told me about this after the fact. She did well, she got the job. But after the fact, she said that in her mind, she was like, what is this person asking me? Is this really happening right now? Okay, I'm in an apocalypse I'm with my friends in a grocery store. There's no zombies. What do I even say? And so her mind immediately went to food and water and like, how are we gonna preserve the food that we do have? Cause there's no electricity. Things are gonna start rotting. It's gonna get gross. Um, but she did, she immediately went to problem solving on how they were going to find sustenance um, and who, you know, figured she talked about how like, oh, well, if I'm with my closest friend, my friend, so-and-so is really good at this. So they're going to start doing that. And then this person's going to do this. So, you know, she, she answered the question well, even though in the moment she was freaking out, like, what kind of question is that? So that would be another um, example of a brain teaser, but it also kind of assesses just fit. Um, and in our culture uh, at Coastal Cloud, our culture is very much, you have to be a curious problem solver. If you are not a curious problem solver, it is tough to cut it here. And so he also was kind of trying to measure like, okay, like I'm gonna throw her in a crazy situation. How is she gonna solve that problem? Other examples of fit culture questions would just be, you know, um, maybe what motivates you? Um, what kind of supervision style do you like to have? Um, and they're, you know, just trying to see how you might um, fit in with the culture and how things kind of work within that company. Okay, so these are all examples of different types of questions. Behavioral, when you're answering behavioral based questions, as I mentioned, these are going to be the more common questions that you run into. This is a helpful method. Um, to keep in mind when you're answering behavioral questions, this is pretty common. You probably, if you've done any interview prep for behavioral, you've probably seen this, this outline, this method before. Um, so it's a good one to remember. Um, I literally have like a notepad here on my desk where I have written star. And when I'm doing an interview, I am putting check boxes next to the yes, the T, the A, the R. So did they tell me the S? Did they tell me the T? Did they tell me the A? Did they tell me the R? Um, so S, what was the situation? Um, they're probably gonna have a very specific question to ask you about a situation, but you do, you do need to kind of set the stage of, of what the situation was. The tasks, so what tasks were involved um, and you know, who was doing what, if it was a team-based um, situation and everybody had their tasks. The action, this very specifically, you can see it says, what action did you take? They wanna know what did you specifically do? So even if it is a team-based example, you do need to tell the situation and the tasks of the team, but don't forget that we wanna hear the action that you took as an individual and then the result. And honestly, I feel like when I'm doing my little check marks on my notepad, the result is usually the one that gets forgotten. Um, and so I just, and it's easy to just ask a follow-up question like, oh, well, and how did it turn out? Um, and maybe it's the, the end result of how it turned out, or perhaps it is just what you learn from the situation or what your takeaway was um, from this story that you told. So I do think keeping this framework in mind and then practicing and practicing and practicing and having lots of examples of past experiences that you can fit into this, um, this outline for telling those stories. Everybody loves a, a good storyteller. Um, so if you can use your past experiences to tell these stories, that's really helpful. So that's the STAR method. All right, here we are. I want you all to read through these questions. I'm gonna pause for a minute. Is anybody's heart raised going up? blood pressure going up. Um, yes, that could, that can happen when you think about these scenarios that you're going to be in. Um, so these are 10 common interview questions that you might likely encounter. There are thousands of questions out there, right? So it is, it's tough to know what you're going to be asked. 
But even if you can be prepared to answer these 10 questions, you may find that you get a question that's similar, not quite the same as one of these, and the answer that you have prepared um, can be altered to fit a similar question. So some of these are culture fit questions, verification questions. You'll see there's several behavioral questions. Um, so I'm just going to start from the top. I want to walk through these and I kind of want to talk through the do's and don'ts um, of answering these questions. So that first question is probably the most common interview question, which is tell me about yourself or what's your professional background. Um, and I think if you are not, if you are in a second, third, fourth round interview, you might not have to answer this question because you've already answered it or they already feel like they know you already. But if it's a first round, this is very likely, or if it's your first time with this interviewer that you're now meeting with, you might get this question for the second or even third time. So do's for tell me about yourself. Practice. This is a question you can practice introducing yourself. Um, you probably have all heard, I heard Caroline earlier say your 30 second commercial, right? You probably have practiced introducing yourself. In an interview setting, this is basically an extended commercial. So if your 30 second commercial is how you meet somebody at a networking event, this goes a little deeper. I would aim for two minutes, maybe maybe three minutes, depending on what kind of information you need to share. Um, but you can practice this question. You can practice what you want to say, and you can tie the information you want to share about yourself directly back to the role that you're interviewing for. So that is a do, I would say, for um, this question. So practice it, tie the things you're going to share back to like why you're sitting here today. I want the best answers I've heard for this. They, you know, they give me maybe some information that's not necessarily on their resume, but it's directly related to why they're sitting in this seat interviewing for this role. Don't, here's your don't, don't ramble on for too long. <laughs> I've uh, experienced people that spend, it's a half hour interview and we are only 15 minutes in and they're still telling me about themselves. Okay, so please don't just go on and on for days. Uh, the other don't for this is don't share too much personal personal information. Some organizations are even going, that's why I had what's your professional background, or you might hear walk me through your resume. Some organizations are even changing the way they ask this because they don't want you to share too much personal information. Um, if you share things that are too personal, it can get, um, um, you kind of get, you could get into trouble with discriminatory practices or um, you just never know. And, and especially if you're interviewing with an HR professional, um, they get a little nervous and then they get uncomfortable if you're sharing too much personal information. Um, so you can sprinkle in personal information that might be relevant, um, or maybe perhaps you're telling a story that involves something that's a personal detail, but it's also related to the role. Um, maybe you're really motivated to work for this particular company because you had a personal experience with them. And that's why you're sitting here today, because you're very passionate about this topic. So there, there are cases for sharing personal information, um, but just edit what you're going to share. You can definitely practice this. Please practice how you answer this question. So that's tell me about yourself. Next, how would former colleagues describe you? This is more of a culture and fit question. Um, they're trying to see how you would fit in, right? So for this one, you can also prep for this one. I recommend if you are conducting a job search and there are people, former colleagues in your life who know about your job search, it's not a confidential one, but you can ask, ask them, ask them how they would describe you. You might be pleasantly surprised um, and maybe even flattered of, of what your colleagues think of you. But with this question, um, they are looking for self-awareness. They want to know that you know, you know, what, how you are perceived, right? So make sure that you um, think about this and, and are able to demonstrate that self-awareness. On the don't, um, this is not the space to dive into the negative. <laughs> so don't share, oh, my former colleagues would say I'm a little lazy because I miss deadlines. Um, not kidding, I had somebody say that once. So don't go negative on this one. All right, next questions, the old strengths and maybe the weaknesses. Um, I have, uh, seen more companies are just focusing on the strengths in this question and just asking about people's strengths. Um, but there are still companies that will ask either about your weaknesses or, you know, what are the opportunities that you have to grow? We are all human, right? Human Humans are flawed. None of us are perfect. Um, if we think we're perfect, then that's a flaw right there, right? So 
the interviewer is a human, you are a human. Um, we all have areas for opportunity and areas for growth. So depending on how they phrase the question, on the do side, know what your strengths are. Be able to articulate your strengths, especially be able to tie them again to the role that you're interviewing for. On your weaknesses or your opportunities for growth, um, the, the common, I would say, cop out on this question is the old, oh, you know, my weakness is that I, I work too hard, you know, or I care too much. Um, that can be seen as kind of cliche um, and just very vague and generalized. So I would have a specific for um, this question. And it might involve you doing a little self-reflection and thinking about what you want to work on when you're answering the weaknesses or the opportunities, just make sure that you have a strategy for how you're addressing it. So for me, I one of my areas for growth um, is that I get very caught up in the now. I love my to-do list. I love thinking about what's tomorrow. I don't always have a vision for the future. Um, and so in my what I've learned about myself is that I need to have people around me, colleagues that have strengths in that area. And that helps me keep a vision for the future. And I can lean on those people to help me come up with the creative big ideas um, and, and kind of, you know, have fun with thinking about what the future could hold. Um, so that would be something that I would share. Um, and, and so just know whatever it is, have a strategy for how you're addressing it and what you've learned from it. Again, this question is looking for your self-awareness um, and making sure that you, you do know yourself. All right. Why do you think you're the best candidate um, for this position? That's a common one um, that people get. And this one, my do for you is you have to determine how to toe the line between um, humility and confidence and overconfidence really. So there is a, there's a spot, there's a sweet spot right in there where you can articulate why you're the best candidate for the position without being arrogant. And I think that's, that's what I caution you. Um, and again, this is another thing that you can practice in the tone, in the way that you, the words that you are using, all these factors play into that perception of whether you're arrogant and overconfident or you know, you're know you right at the level that you need to be as far as your confidence in taking on this position. Um, and then if you can um, give examples of why you're the best candidate. Um, so don't forget to do that is really my don't for this one. All right, we're gonna get into some behavioral questions here. So tell me about a time you faced a difficult challenge. Tell me about a time you failed or you made a mistake and tell me about one of your most recent accomplishments. So these are pretty common behavioral questions. Remember when I talked about the STAR method, you're interviewing, the interviewer is trying to determine your future behavior based on your past behavior. So you should have examples for at least these three and more. Um, I recommend having at least 10 STAR stories like prepped and ready to go and think about what category do these stories fall into? So your, your example of a recent accomplishment might also be, if they don't ask you that question, but they ask you about a time that you were a leader, it might be the same example, right? So know your 10 stories and know what kind of questions that they could answer. Um, don't be afraid to dig into not just your work experiences, maybe if you're a student classroom experiences, or if you volunteer in any capacity, maybe you have examples from your volunteer work. Um, so, so it doesn't always necessarily have to be a strictly professional example. So keep that in mind. Um, so use your star. And then my don't on all of these is don't forget the results. Like I said earlier, people forget to tell me that are, what, what was the outcome of the situation or what did they learn from the situation? especially on the mistake. Um, I usually say, tell me about a time you made a mistake or you failed to meet a goal you had set for yourself. Cause I want to see one, that you can acknowledge that you made a mistake um, and that two, you learned something from it. Um, a red flag for me would be if someone is telling me about the time that they made a mistake and they immediately go to, but you know, the reason it happened is because so-and-so over here, or my supervisor didn't do this, like, and they're just immediately like deflecting the blame. Um, I want to hear a true example of when 
you know, you would do something differently if you could have gone back and done it. And then also just what did you learn from that? Um, and with all of these, again, you want to have those stories prepared because you want them to tie to the role that you're interviewing for. All right. I already told you guys that being long-term planning strategic is not my strength. So this is the question I hate the most <laughs> personally. Where do you see yourself in five years? I just immediately cringe and then 10 years, I'll start sweating. Okay, so so for me, this, this is a common question that you might get and it's the one that I hate the most just because I know myself. Um, sometimes I, I don't even know what we're doing next weekend. So how can I tell you where I see myself in five years? So um, do you have a plan for this? Um, and I think this is another reason, another chance for you to demonstrate that you have thought about your career path. Um, that is an important thing that I'm looking for when I'm interviewing. I just want a candidate to show me that they put some thought into where they want their career to go and that this role is a is the next step in that plan. Um, I don't need them to come in saying, you know, oh, well, in five years, I want to be running the place. That's not realistic, right? But I do want them to at least have thought a little bit about, you know, maybe it's not what their next position is in five years, but it's that they want to grow in a certain area. They want to become an expert in X, Y, and Z. Um, they want to be able to lead a pro, you know, lead a client project. Um, they want to be able to influence their peers. You can also focus in on the strengths that you want to develop in the next five years. Um, and then for your 10 year strategy, you certainly want to, you know, start thinking about like the next position, the next position or the opportunities for advancement or the opportunities for learning. Maybe you wanna get certified um, in something and really become an expert and that's a longer process. So at least start thinking you know, about uh, the things that you have as far as goals for yourself. Um, because when, when you think about employees and you have your, your A plus players, um, a lot of those people demonstrate the characteristics, characteristics of self-motivation, self-development, self-growth, you know, they're always learning, they're always making themselves better. Um, and so that's kind of what this question, at least to me, helps demonstrate is that you have a plan. Um, it doesn't have to be too specific, but you're at least, you know, focused on always improving yourself. All right, how do you like to receive feedback? This is also a culture or a fit question. So for this one, um, do you think about how you like to receive feedback? Um, and it varies for every person. Um, if you like in the moment feedback or if you um, like regular check-ins with your supervisor where you have you know, both positive and the areas for improvement um, to discuss. Um, so just give a little bit of thought of how you like to receive feedback um, and also demonstrate that you are open to feedback. Again, we are all humans and we are all flawed. So make sure you know how you like to get the feedback um, in so that you can get, always be continuing to improve. All right, and last but not least, what questions do you have for me? This is usually how um, interviewers will close the interview. The biggest do is have questions, okay? That's, I, I have been in interviews where I asked if they had questions at the end and they said, oh, you know, I don't think I have any. Have something. Um, and even if this is your third round interview, there's there are always things that you can ask. Um, maybe this is the first time you've met this person that you're not interviewing with. Ask them a question about their background. That might show one, that you've done your research on the person um, and two, you value their opinion. So make sure that you have questions to ask, have them written down, don't hesitate to ask them. On the don't side, um, keep a conscious eye on the time. If your interview is only scheduled for an hour and there are only a few minutes left in your interview, don't launch into a litany of question after question after question and make it awkward for your interviewer to have to close the interview because maybe they need to get to the next meeting or the next interview. Um, so do keep an eye on the time when you get to this portion of the interview. If you don't get a chance to ask all the questions that you have, you can always ask, hey, would it be appropriate for me to um, follow up with you via email uh, with some, some questions I didn't get to ask, they're probably going to say, yes, that's fine. Um, because again, they, they're probably keeping a conscious eye on the time as well. Okay. Those are my do's and don'ts on these 10 interview questions. I will say it was fun to, I did a little crowdsourcing to come up with these 10. 
Um, and I, that's where I got some of the more fun ones that aren't as common, uh, but it turned into this whole lively discussion about um, just the crazy interview questions that people have gotten and, and then these that are the more common ones. All right, and I know Amanda dropped in the chat that I am open to ask answering questions, so I would love to hear what questions you have. I'm happy to back up in slides or um, just see what's on your mind. Hey, Sarah, we do have one in person. I'm going to walk the mic over to her now. Awesome. Um, I know negotiation is uh, of your benefits and your salary is something that um, has come to my mind. When is the best time to do that? Is that something that should come up at that first interview? Is that something that you know, it might be your only interview, or is it something that, you know, should come when they go to offer you the position? That kind of seems like late in the game, but when's the best time to do that? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And I think it is dependent on the company and kind of where in the process they like to have that conversation. Um, I would say that in the that first interview, if you do have questions just about the benefit package in general, those would be, that would be an appropriate time to ask that. But as far as any kind of negotiating when it comes to benefits, compensation, et cetera, you wouldn't want to do that in the early stages of the interview. Now they may directly ask you, you know, what are your salary expectations? So you do need to think about how you want to answer that question. Um, a lot of companies are gathering information about that when they, when you're applying. So maybe they're asking for, you know, what are your expected salary, um, it's such a it's such a delicate dance <laughs> that we do on this front because nobody wants to show their cards first, right? So you don't want to be the one to be like, well, here's my expected salary because <laughs> what if the employer's like, oh, well, she's cheap, let's lock her in at that you know nice cheap rate. Um, but you but you know you don't want an employer to be thinking about you that way, right? Um, so this can be that can be a hard one, but I would say any kind of actual negotiation where you're saying you know this the once you get the offer, then it's easier to have that conversation. And also I would say, not just when you get the offer verbally, but like when you have it in writing, in email or whatever format, we send DocuSign documents um, here at Coastal Cloud. When you get that in writing, then it's, an, it's a more comfortable time to start any kind of negotiation process. Um, but again, I say that I, I know um, colleagues and friends that have talked salary before the offer stage, just to like, hey, let's just get closer on the same page so that we can save the back and forth later. Um, so that's appropriate too. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm trying to, I'm checking out the chat here too. Oh yes, what, what Caroline said. Um, but yeah, I, I would, my advice would be any kind of actual negotiate negotiation, like back and forth on that topic, come after the offer stage. Um, but in the interview, first, second round interviews, I would play it by ear and just kind of see what questions do they ask and um, be prepared to have those conversations. But I wouldn't go too hard on the negotiation until you actually have the offer in hand. Thank you. Anything else I can answer? Thank you to Sarah. Um, that was really a holistic approach to, to interviewing. Um, I think she went from every perspective and what a great job she did. So thanks again. And I, I know you'll want to show your appreciation in the chat box as well. So now's the time to talk about who's hiring. And if you are an employer and have an active job lead, please make your uh, way to the podium at this point in-house, or if you're online, just raise your, your hand and we will give you a spotlight to tell us about your job lead. Do we have anyone doing that? Okay. Well, if you um, wanted to get that to us uh, before our new, uh, newsletter goes out this afternoon, then you can get that to our um, email, jobclub at UKY, and we will include that this afternoon in our list of job leads, current job leads. So be sure and do that, and we'll let everyone know what you've got. 
So now it's time to talk about uh, our partners, uh, the facilitating partners, and what's going on in their each of their um, worlds. And cooperative extension, there's always lots going on. Um, we want to remind everyone to check with their local extension office. Make sure you do that. Fall programs are really, really in session now. And uh, each of the 120 counties has a different agenda, but one that I'm sure you could benefit from with their educational workshops and offerings. So Fayette County that we're here presently, they are, um, we have, we're looking at all the programs in the hallway and we've got some groups meeting here today. So just make sure you check out Fayette County if you're close by. Our UK Steps Temporary Employment, Nicole Waite could not be with us today, but we always have lots of good um, recommendations for temporary employment at the University of Kentucky. It's called Steps. So be sure and check that website out because you're going to be amazed at the opportunities to get your foot in the door at UK, maybe on a temporary status, but we have testimonies here within the, the, this uh, meeting today where people started in steps and then they elevated that job position to some other um, permanent, to, to the permanent. So UK Alumni Career Services with the Alumni um, Association, UK Alumni. We wanna tell you that these offerings are also available to you. So check out those websites at www.ukalumni.net. And you can find career and events. You could also, um, there's a professional development book club and some career counseling opportunities. Next time at Job Club, November the 8th, it's LinkedIn time, so we always want to cover uh, the necessity and the changing world of LinkedIn so that you will be in the know. So this is LinkedIn Networking Tips, making meaningful professional connections to grow your network. And you, we know the bottom line of the job search is our network and how we can reach out to others so that they in turn can lead us to that desired job. So be sure and join us on November the 8th, and this will be presented by Ramana, Ramania Osman, and she is External Partnerships Associate with the Lewis Honors College at the University of Kentucky. So she will tell us how to connect and design a professional profile using LinkedIn. So don't miss this one because, as you know, we never fail to mention it. It was mentioned today that if we want to connect to people and to uh, enlarge our network, we have to be on LinkedIn. So until then, on behalf of uh, UK Cooperative Extension and the UK Alumni Association, as well as UK Human Resources, we thank you for joining us today. And we look forward to you being with us again on November the 8th. Have a great day.